I'd left, like everyone to please be seated for our next contest. Now we will conduct the humorous speech contest. I am working to speak slowly so that we can have more of our Toastmasters in our seats. <laughs> and as you're taking your seats, if you use your cell phone during the break, any fuzzy, tweety, ringing, singing, crying, laughing, giggling machine, please, please ensure that it is on silent or alarm or better yet. Turn it off. Once the contest has begun, the sergeant at arms will secure the doors. I feel the anticipation is building. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it is determined that all the ballots have been collected. Here is our speaking order for the humorous speech contest. Contestant number one, Eric Feinendigen. Contestant number two, Jim Futransky. Contestant number three, Cyrus Bracey. Contestant number four, Lawrence Brown. Contestant number five, Stacy Kelly. Contestant number six, Carol Levins. We will proceed with the humorous speech contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballots. We will now begin the humorous speech contest. Eric Feinendigen, Confessions of a Referee. Confessions of a Referee, Eric Feinendigen. He kept yelling, hey ref, you're blind. 
I know, I know, I need better eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> I even had a grade school coach tell me, you'll never work in this gym again. You must think I'm ready for the big stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, after a few games of this, I began to realize that the evaluations I received here in Toastmasters, like the ones we heard here today, are much more constructive. <laughs> they really needed a pep talk. That's when a veteran referee named Rocky came over to me. And he said, Eric, it's one thing you gotta understand. Not everyone likes a whistleblower. And being a zebra, well, it's not all black and white. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you two bits of advice. Number one, never park in a space marked reserved for the referee. <laughs> I don't care how close to the gym it is. <laughs> and number two, when you look in the mirror every morning, always remember, it's not the players, and it's not the coaches you have to be concerned about. It's those parents. <laughs> and I soon found out that those parents actually stood for temperamental, hostile, obscene, self-absorbed, and emotional parents. <laughs> Webster's Dictionary defines them as a species of parent who lives their lives as normal, well-adjusted adults, yet turn into Rage spewing, crazy lunatics at youth sporting events. <laughs> Nothing drives more fear to the heart of an official than when we look up into the stands and we see one of those parents. Now, if you're not sure if you've seen one or that you might actually be one, <laughs> there are five warning signs to look for. Number one. You bring a sign to the gym that reads, my kid can beat up your kid. <laughs> Folks, not the kind of sportsmanship that we're looking for. Number two, at the games, your spouse won't sit next to you. <laughs> or anyone else for that matter. If you sit down, look around, and there's no one with an earshot, you've got issues. <laughs> Number three, even the coach asks you to leave. Uh, Sir, I'm sorry, but the team bench is for players only. <laughs> <laughs> Number four, you wore a shirt to the game that says, win or die trying to a sixth grade girls game? <laughs> and fine. You bring a megaphone to the game to yell at the referees and your kids? Now I'll admit that us officials will blow a call or two or three or four or five <laughs> during a game. But come on, everyone knows we'll make up for it later on. That's the first thing they teach you in referee school. But people, leave the kids alone. Now, can you imagine if you went to work every day and all anybody did was yell instructions in your ears the whole time? It'll drive you nuts. Yet, I see it in almost every game. You've got Pooler Justin here with the ball. You've got Jimmy's dad saying, pass, pass, pass. Joy's dad saying, shoot, shoot, shoot. Your man's dad saying, dribble, dribble, dribble. Next thing you know it, you got poor little Justin. He looks like an octopus on roller skates. Oh, activity in a fit of confusion. So parents, quit yelling at your kids. There's a reason they have a coach. <laughs> now, if you feel yourself being overcome with a bout of this sideline rage, or if you suffer from road rage, speech rage, or any form of anxiety, I'm going to give you an exercise that will help you. So let's all do it together. We're simply going to take a deep breath, and the exhale we're going to say, it's OK. So deep breath. It's OK. Now don't you feel better? I know I do. Well, I'm sure that we've had this discussion. In a conclusion, whether it's in sports or in life. Let's go out and have fun, encourage one another, and always remember, it's okay. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Mrs. Jones, <coughs> Mrs. Jones, the trophies are for players only. <laughs> Another one of those parents. I gotta go. Madam Toastmaster.
It's okay. <laughs> Jim Flutrasky, you can do it. You can do it. Jim Flutrasky. If you have problems, and we all have problems, I'm here to tell you, Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, you can solve your problems. You can do it. Perhaps you have family problems. My friend Jerry had family problems. I bumped into her about a month ago. She said, Jim, I don't know what to do. My son and husband treat me like dirt. Last night I made a wonderful dinner for my husband, and all he could say was, These peas are overcooked. <laughs> and what is this slimy sauce anyway? <laughs> then my son walked in the door. Mom, Mom, I ran your tree into a car. Uh, I ran your car into a tree. <laughs> the wreck's in the driveway. You gotta go out and pay the tow truck driver right away. Oh, there's my friends. Bye. <laughs> I said, Carrie, you need to learn to communicate better with your family members. You need to acquire powerful communications tools. And you know, that's exactly what she did. No, she didn't go to Toastmasters. <laughs> she went down to her local sporting goods store and bought a machete. <laughs> walked back into her living room where her husband and son were watching TV and said, Family, from now on, this is how I'm going to communicate. <laughs> and then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw sitting on a table her husband's most cherished possession, his Sammy Sosa bobblehead. <laughs> <laughs> she swung that machete and she decapitated Sammy and pieces of cork flew all over <laughs> I bumped into her a few days ago. She said, Jim, I love my powerful communications tool. <laughs> my husband doesn't complain about dinner anymore. He makes dinner. <laughs> my son does the dishes. And they both just bought me a new car. <laughs> Carrie solved her family problems. You can do it too. But maybe you have health problems. Mary had health problems. She gave me a call a couple months ago. She said, Jim, I don't know what to do. I spend all day sitting on the couch eating potato chips, one chip after another. I'm getting really heavy. I'm getting so heavy I can't get off the couch. I can't even clean my house. There's balls of dust rolling along the floor. I said, Mary, you have an ineffective habit of eating potato chips all day. You need to replace that ineffective habit with an effective habit. Well, I wondered what happened to her. And then I got a call from her about a week ago. She said, Jim, I did exactly as you said. I called up the grocery store and ordered 400 cases of energy drink. <laughs> Sending out resumes is not sufficient. 
you need to go out and network. And when you network, use your elevator speech. And when you use your elevator speech, be honest. Tell people who you really are. So the next day, Larry put on a suit, he took the L downtown, and he got off the L in front of the headquarters of an enormous bank. Except he didn't see a bank. He saw a networking opportunity. So he walked into that bank building, and he walked up to the teller window, and he delivered his elevator speech. <laughs> I am a psychopath. I care nothing about morality or the feelings of others. I only care about my own gratification. But I'm very skillful. I'm not only duplicitous, I'm also malicious. <laughs> well, that teller's eyes got really big, and she pressed that <laughs> her counsel. And two big security guards came and took Larry, and they took him over to an elevator, and they took him up to the 75th floor, and they took him to a corner office. We're sitting behind a huge mahogany desk was the president of the bank. The president came out and said, I've been on the lookout for people like you. And now that I've got you, here's what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to make you chief financial officer. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our management team. You're going to fit right in. <laughs> I saw Larry the other day. He was riding by in his new Lamborghini. And you, Mr. and Ms. Taxpayer, are funding his bonus. <laughs> so if you have problems, let me give you some advice. Remember Carrie, Mary, and Larry. <laughs> they solve their problems. And you can do it too. Not a toast. while the judges mark their ballots. And I have, excuse me, Cyrus Bracing. How I drove a Porsche in high school. How I drove a Porsche in high school. Cyrus Bracing. This is the true story of how I drove a Porsche in high school. Now, don't get the wrong impression. My parents were not well off. My father was a high school English teacher with the Chicago Public School System. Hmm. You know how much they make. <laughs> <laughs> now, and, and the other part is I didn't even have a job. But I did have an older brother. Three years my senior. My brother and I, there were some distinct differences between our personalities. My brother was more business-minded, sneaky, <laughs> Underhanded. Now watch the guy. Future politician. <laughs> yeah, he got his first job at about age 15. Now me, 
I've always been good with my hands. If you ask my mom, she'll tell you, even as a baby, in my crib, the mobile above my crib stopped working. I had that thing apart in about 10 minutes, put it back together, and it's still working with this thing. <laughs> now, one day, my brother came to me with a business proposition. He said, little brother, why don't I buy a car? You fix it, and we'll split the profits. 50-50. Two days later, he shows up, pulls up in the, in the in front of the house and says, hey, hey, you got to come and see this. I just bought an MGB GT, 1970, this thing needed so much work, had a blown engine, transmission problems, electrical system needed work, and we ain't going to talk about the rust. <laughs> now, I'm up for a good challenge. I worked on that car, put my blood, sweat, and tears in that car for about eight months. And then here he comes again. Hey, little brother, I got a buyer for the car. I'm getting ready to drop the new engine in. He's like, no, 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 just get everything together. And he goes off in his closed door with a new buyer. And I watch the car go away on a flatbed. I'm like, okay, great. Money in my pocket. This will be great. He comes out. He says, hey, well, Things didn't go as well as I had planned. Here's $100, and I'll take care of you on the next one. <laughs> I was about 15 at this time. And I'm thinking, OK, he'll take care of me. About a month later, he pulls up in front of the house. A white Porsche 914 target top, leather seats five-speed transmission, electronic fuel injection system. As I said, I'm very good with my hands. And a little wiser now. <laughs> now, I know he's thinking, I've got a little, my little brother. I've got a Porsche. He was 19. I even think I saw him do the risky business. <laughs> Tom, Tom Cruise, little slide. He's like, and I've got this live-in mechanic. <coughs> well, I was thinking something else. I was thinking, it's time to recoup my losses from that last year. <laughs> so I was going to a vocational high school. Electronics was my major. And what, you know, we were learning useful things like timing circuits. I added a little modification to the Porsche. I put a little button underneath the dashboard you didn't start, when you start the car, you push a little button, everything's fine. If by some chance you didn't know about the little button, <laughs> after about 15 minutes, this is a randomized time, 15, maybe 20 minutes, sometimes even an hour, that, but that timing circuit was tied to the electric fuel pump, which would cut off, and once your fuel pump cuts off, the car cuts off. Now, I did have a sense of humor back then. I, would tell, I told my brother, I said, there's a short, it must be a relay, something in the, in the fuel system, I'm working on it. I'll get it fixed, just, it, it's, just give me a little time. But I do know, if you get out of the car, you know, if it stops on you, get out, run around to the passenger side, underneath the rear wheel well, Feel this little round thing here? Just jiggle it a little bit. And, you know, get back in. It should start up after a little while. Now the time circuit would reset after a little while and go through that same process again. Well, he got the impression that the car was not as reliable as he would like. So my brother, he worked downtown, went to school downtown. By the time I got up in the morning, he was gone. At that time, he did a lot of borrowing my mom's car, taking mom to work, riding a bus, asking friends for rides. By the time I got up, everybody was gone. I'd hop in that Porsche, <laughs> the top, drive to school. It was a lovely thing. Junior <laughs> flew throughout my whole junior and senior year of high school. Now, the funny thing is, a couple years later after the car was gone, a, couple, a good friend of my brother's, Came up to him, he's like, hey, Vic, hey, Vic, does your brother still have that Porsche? <laughs> now, I, one, 
last thing, I do have to take you guys in my confidence. Please, don't tell them, because this to this day. I still don't know. <laughs> I have Lawrence Brown. The day donuts disappeared. <laughs> the day donuts disappeared. Lawrence Brown. Fries. <laughs> you, you do have French fries. 
they have french fries. <laughs> I have a question. Do you ever run out of french fries? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> they don't run out of french fries. You know, funny thing, I was just over at Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> and they ran out of donuts. <laughs> cousin works at Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> and she just talked about a guy that tried to get a blueberry donut. That was me. <laughs> Crazy, right? Well, anyway, can I get a can I get apple pie? Oh, okay, thanks. So I'm driving along with my imaginary friend, and we decide that we're going to go back to Dunkin' Donuts. I'm going to make my point. So, go back to Dunkin' Donuts. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Could I get a blueberry donut? <laughs> you, you still don't have donuts. You won't have them until in the morning. I don't know. Should I ask her? <laughs> Why don't you have donuts? <laughs> Today's Donut Day. National Donut Day. <laughs> Gotta get out. <laughs> uh, you have munchkins. Are you munchkin donuts or Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> I munchkins, I want a Dunkin' Donut. I want a blueberry donut. <laughs> so, after this, my imaginary friend and I are so outraged, we decide we are going to start an organization. Now, some of you have heard of the FDIC, right? Yes. They insure deposits, bank deposits. So we decide we're going to start our own FDIC. Forever have donuts in the case. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted to shorten it down. What we would like for you to do, my imaginary friend and I, and you and your imaginary friends, is to join us. No more days without donuts. <laughs> I'm Lawrence Brown, and I approve this message. <laughs>
she came on to give the music news. New Monkeys auditions will be held at 310 52nd Street in Midtown Manhattan on Tuesday, August 12, 1986. Something has changed from the original auditions 21 years ago. Women are now asked to audition. I scream. Ah! Okay. <laughs> for a TV show. And I'll tell you, it was love. <laughs> love for the monkeys, love for the music, and big capital L-O-V-E, love for Davy Jones. <laughs> I can't remember a time when the monkeys were not part of my life. Now, for those of you that don't know, the monkeys were a fabricated TV, a fabricated band put together for a TV show. The show ran from 1966 to 1968. The original auditions in 1964 had 437 applicants. Among them was Stephen Stills and rumored Charles Manson. Can you imagine? Charles Manson. In the end, from the original auditions, they cast Mickey Dolenz and Mike Nesmith, who were two aspiring musicians. They also cast Mickey Dolenz, who had been a child star, and the diminutive but oh so cute British Broadway star Tony nominated Davy Jones. <laughs> now, when, back in 1976 when the monkeys made their first resurgence, I was nine years old. I was keeping this diary. This is the actual diary. January 1st, 1976. I love Davy Jones. <laughs> January 17th, 1976. I love Davy Jones. <laughs> February 3rd, 1976. I love Davy Jones. <laughs> March 29th, 1976. I love Davy so much. I wish I could tell people just how much I love Davy. Nobody would understand how much I love Davy. <coughs> you get the picture. <laughs> Magazines. This is from the 80s. I really, I still have them. I <laughs> True diehard monkeys fan. You can imagine when they announced these auditions how excited I was. I always wanted to be a monkey. I always wanted to meet Davy. Now I could be a monkey. I could meet Davy, and maybe Davy would fall in love with me. Maybe Davy would marry me. Maybe I could have Davy's children. <laughs> <laughs> that, my folks, is what put me on the plane to New York City. <laughs> On Monday, August 11, 1986, Lori and I arrived in New York. The next morning, we took a cab to 310 West 52nd Street and joined the line that was already around the block. There were, there were about 3,000 applicants at the second of these auditions, compared to the 437 in the first. I was wearing my black and white Depeche Mode sweatshirt and these. My black and white optical illusion pants. <laughs> they don't fit or I would be wearing them. <laughs> I thought I looked really cool, I, but I actually was, two hours later, really hot. <laughs> it was August and it was New York. Four hours later at noon, I was bored and tired and hungry. And all I wanted to do was just leave, but I stayed. Three o'clock, Lori and I were finally ushered into this warehouse. I sat down in front of this good-looking 30-something man, and I handed him my resume. Oh, it says here you went to North Farmington High School. I 
I know someone who went to North Arlington High School. Oh, really? Who? I know who he's going to say. Pam Dauber. See, I told you. <laughs> Pam Dauber was on Mork and Mindy, for those of you that don't know. Oh, yeah, we had a couple famous people that went to my high school. We had a Playboy bunny and some guy that hijacked an airplane. Why did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it says here you sing. Yeah, I, I sing for this band. It's called Hairspray. I don't really sing for a band. Oh, um, really? Well, do you want to hear me sing? Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, it says here you write lyrics. Yeah, I do. Uh, do you want to see them? Oh, no, that's okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Next thing I know, I'm back on the pavement in New York City. The whole thing lasted for five minutes. I had a visor and a button that said I love the new monkeys. <laughs> Some of you may think that this was a waste of my time, but how many people out there have actually done something like this, have followed the dream and gone and done something that nobody else would expect it? Well, I can still say I did it. And hey, hey, I could have been a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> We'll now have Carol Levins. Dating, important information. Dating, important information. Carol Levins.
you'll spend the entire day talking about someone else. It <laughs> <laughs> never end. And I don't know if Chris has any more friends, but I guarantee. Avoid that one. Being stood up, I regretfully admit, I was once stood up by proxy. <laughs> the best of us lost. Uh, thought he was such a nice guy. Johnny Warren, I, I met him at a bar. He seemed very charming and sincere. And so I went to the designated place of the alleged date. And who should show up but his very best friend, Barney the Spider Face? <laughs> Jenny's not coming. I'm standing you up. Wow. That's my message, Jenny. Well, I had a message for Johnny. And I, I want to tell you, I, I don't take being stood up sitting down. I don't see eye to eye with my dates. And you can just tell Johnny never to call me, never to. And, and one more thing. I know for a fact that your middle name isn't Thaw. <laughs> that got him. That got his attention. You gotta be ready for these things. You gotta get in your toes. This can happen. Well, your, your, your Prince Charming will come. I guarantee. Might not be on a white shining horse. Might be on a Pinto. <laughs> Mustang. Could be a Ford. This personal preference here, though, I personally avoid skateboarders. <laughs> now, a lot of people slip over them, but I don't, I don't personally think it's a good date. They have no back seats. <laughs> <laughs> you want know, one thing is, uh, I have some standards. I still have some standards here. Uh, if you have to prepare for a date in which requires a safety helmet, it's, it's, gonna, it's a turn off for me. <laughs> So, that to each his own, as, as, as I say. You might not uh, have these problems that I sometimes have. Oh, another thing would be, you yeah, all heard that you got to kiss a lot of frogs before you kiss your prince. <laughs> no, don't do it. Don't do it. This is, don't. It's, it's a big mistake. The face and skin infections are astronomical. <laughs> And I can guarantee, without any hesitation, you kiss a lot of frogs, there won't be a prince on this planet that will get no those lips. <laughs> but a lot of people fall for this. I, I, it clears up. <laughs> prince will be there. The main thing about that is stick to your own species. Isn't it obvious? <laughs> She said it's a real tiger. She, his ears, his whiskers, his tail. And I told her to spell disaster in every language. I looked that up, by the way, every language. <laughs> Think of the future. Your house will be one big litter box. You get kids. They'll put their paws on the furniture. You can throw any disciplinary improvements. I'll get you that. Um, anyway, she says it's too late. We're going to have my mom over for dinner. Uh, I found that hard to chew. <laughs> I tried to warn her. Look, one thing is certain. You'll thank me for this later. I'm doing my best. I'm revealing these experiences just to say, I could have saved a life by now, by the way. <laughs> so I'll leave you with just two words, because I know you will thank me. You're welcome. <laughs>
Madam Toastmaster, all ballots have been collected. Uh, yeah, 
for this contest. I'm representing <laughs> Lake County 652972. Is that right, Mr. Right. <laughs> Yes. 
tell us a little bit about that and have you had the opportunity to see any rare birds or birds that you don't often see in this area? Uh, first of all, I've got to say for this contest, I'm representing Liberty Moto 978568. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an interest in it first because my son in law is an apple bird watcher, and I went on a like a bird watching seminar at Rocky Mountain National Park this summer and got the key to bird watching, which is don't look for the birds. Just be aware and let the birds find you. And since then, I've done that, and the birds have been finding me. What kind of birds have you seen that you don't see that often? And I don't. Well, I, I'm not advanced enough to see the ones you don't see that often. <laughs> <laughs> what about the ones you have <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll see hawks. In my area, I live in the old school forest preserve, and I've seen hawks there. And so what I do is I, I take my little binoculars with me and walk in there, and if a bird finds me, that's great. If not, it's a nice walk. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in the city, so the birds are going to start with pigeons. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
long time before I started learning to read Roman numerals that I realized, looking at the fine print on television, it's 1968. <laughs> 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 so now I'm a little bit heartbroken at the end of my shoulder. theater, theater, musicals. Um, I haven't been singing as long as I've been acting. I've been acting as long as I can remember, but at about 31, I decided that I wanted to sing, that there are probably more parts for me out there in musical theater because of my voice and the type that I was at the time. And I found this great class at Old Town School and started singing, and I've been doing it ever since it's been, you know, like 14 years or something like that. So you can do it even when you get a little bit older. You don't have to start as a kid, although I wish I had. But, um, You're following your dreams. So yes, that's exactly. To some extent. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And welcome. I just want to make an announcement real quick that if any contestant desires a copy of this before they're publicly released after the conference, please see me after the uh, contest and I'll give you a card where you can email me to get a link for it. You must be have the contest. It will be for this contest only. It's to evaluate your own speech.
time, I'd like to turn the lectern over to our North Division Governor of Focal Teeth and the leadership team because now we're to the moment where we've been waiting for to find out the winners of today's contest. Be 
each evaluation winner. Ben Sanders!